Good afternoon, good evening, good morning. This is the Wix Online Meeting 188, 513, May 13th. I don't know. It's a Wednesday or something like that on 2020. As always, these meetings are recorded for those of you that aren't with us right here, right now. I think all we have on the agenda really is triage, unless somebody wants to throw some stuff in in questions, comments. Otherwise, uh, let's go ahead and get into triage, roll through this, and see what we find. Bob, you ready? I am ready. All right, here we go. We have a few issues to talk about. Uh, this first one is Sean's uh, whip experience. Um, are we going to talk about this today? Are we prepared to talk about this today? Um, I mean, the whip's there. Wait, what's this? Oh, the web page. I see. Interesting. Interesting. <laughs> huh. I, that's kind of cool. We can look at it here. It's here. That was such a ringing endorsement of reviewing it or not reviewing it, Sean. Um, did you want to talk about it at all? Or I haven't. I personally haven't had time to just sit down and look at it in detail. Um, I know we talked about this many, many, many moons ago. Um, I mean, I guess it's pretty much in line with what we were talking about where we're going to change it to where the BA can decide what the UI level is. Mm -hmm. And then it looked like in order for us to support embedded UI, we need to also allow them to just completely disable the external message right. handler that Boom sets up. So then, like all of that, we had decided, but then for like standard BA, there's multiple routes we could go. I mean, theoretically, we could make standard BA not support any of this at all, or we could make it to where it stays doing what it does today, where you can't show full UI during modify, for instance where we could go ahead and let it show modify like full ui for everything and then i guess the question there is should we allow standard ba to uh, support showing embedded ui and then the other open question that i ran into was how we're handling the properties so i guess we kind of talked about where the BA was just going to be able to set the properties, but it didn't look like that was going to be very easy to do. And I'm not sure it'd be very helpful to let BAs just throw random properties in. So I thought, <laughs> I thought we should have, like, they can pick which property they want to send. Like, if they think that the user should be doing a modify operation, then they can ask Burn to use to put in a modify property. And then that way, if the BA doesn't care what the user does, then they can just tell Burn not to add any property, or they can pick one of the operations that they think should be happening. So I think that's basically it. Modify the attribute to take condition, set it be configured at runtime. If not, specify the internal UI will never be shown, right? Same condition is used for all operations. Wix standard will not change the value of action property. Wix standard will not support embedded UI, so we'll never set the disable. Disable external UI handler. Boolean. <laughs> right, <laughs> to true. Not support embedded UI, so it will never set disable external UI handler. Is that true? Right. Disable. Oh, disable external UI handler. You need that for embedded UI. Right. Uh, too many double negatives in there. Yeah, about the new burn MSI install, burn MSI modify, burn MSI repair, and burn MSI uninstall properties. So 
is your charge to choose the same action they may choose in the burn anyway, right? They can at least do something in their UI to play well with burn. Right. And then there are plans to support an embedded UI. Right. On plan WI for each MSI author in the chain. Action MSI property. Default action MSI property based on the plan action. Always what you want to level the path. Right, always default to the false, right? Provide the UI level and on ex again so that BA doesn't have to keep track of what it chose during the plan. Okay. So the BA will know when the MSI comes along if it's going to be showing UI or not. Right. The WI package is a little bit odd. I understand you want to do it for both MSI and MSP, right? Right. Yeah, I don't think anyone actually uses WI. Since, you know, I don't know, 99, 2000. But we don't have a better generic since we have MSI package and MSP package. You'd have to say Windows installer, which is really long. Really long, yeah. feels weird that burn is like setting properties. I mean, it's setting properties already. Yeah, sorry. It, it's, it's setting custom hard coded property names. I don't know what else you would do though. I don't know what else you would do there. It, it I don't know. I, just off the top of my head, it feels weird that it, the BA isn't the thing setting the properties. But this is because right now the BA doesn't have a convenient way of adding properties to package execution, does it? I mean, one thing I was trying to avoid was having to prevent BAs from setting well-known properties. Like we don't want them doing, what is it like remove or whatever, where you're choosing special functionality that Burns already taking care of. Right, so right now a BA can't add properties. They have to be authored, which means they have to pass through the compiler and linker to take effect and we have the opportunity to stop them. <sighs> yeah. Yeah, okay. But really on standard BA, I, I really don't care which approach we took, we take. It's just that that number three was the only one that would actually use the properties that we had been talking about. Number three, up, which one? Of the, of the initial things? Yeah, of Wix standard BA, I gave like three options. And the third one was the only one that actually would use the properties we had been talking about. Yeah, it might be a little confusing because I gave three options for burn and for standard BA, but yeah. <laughs> Clearly, just pick the last one. It's always the right one. Yeah. Then there are three. 
three approaches you can take from a standard view. For display internal UI, yep. Allow subs or show MSI during non install operation. Yep. Yep, yep, yep. I don't know how you get around setting these at burn. I also don't think that, I mean, if they're going to be called this, they're named properly if they're coming from burn, I'd argue. I mean, you could say Wix burn, but that seems a little bit excessive. Um, I don't know. It, it sounds right. It sounds like the way you have to go about doing it. I'm still just tripping on this name. <laughs> I keep seeing whip in it, and I, it's just like it's tripping me up. Do we really call it? Do we have, oh, this is a BA on plan. We don't have anything like this, do we? Do we? It's just a generic on plan package today. We don't have an on plan WI package. And we have on plan related package. Yeah. When does this somewhere between package begin and package complete? Right, call that. This is like if you have uh, feature selection enabled, you'll get additional messages. Yeah, the same kind of thing. Yeah. I really want to call it MSI package, but <laughs> and no, 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 no. We meant the MSI in the general term, not the I guess, WI. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it's fine. I I would settle for that minor ambiguity. I just think that's so weird. Just feels weird because the chances that you're going to do a patch with full UI is pretty low anyway. I don't know how many patches show their UI in the world, given how many are left. So, but otherwise, this is this is yeah, this is it. I think that's how it has to be done. All right, cool. Works for me. I mean, still cool. rolling with it. Uh, has there been any movement on this one? No. Um, should we put, keep it around to put a retry around that stuff? In four? I didn't... Sorry, what are you I, talking about? I didn't, I didn't think that would be a good idea, <laughs> because... That's like a OS call that's failing in just this build. It like I feel like by the time we release Wix four, it'd be obsolete anyway. Yeah, but it is it is one of those places that'll you know open a file handle. That's why it it makes sense that yeah that could happen. It is one of those places that could hit a file handle. Um, MSI get file version. And retrying is typically what we do when we have problems opening file handles. Well, my concern is that it's it, it's it's an access violation, access violation exception. Oh. Expand the stack trace. Yeah, I just did. Oh. I missed the little arrow the first time. Um, oh, that's odd. That is odd. That's not a file in use. That's something else. Oh, up on their two version 1909, running as 1809, and it's having this problem. Um, okay, Sean, I agree with you. We're just going to have to let this one roll, I think. And be like, yeah, Windows has a bug. It looks like they fixed it. You should get that fixed. I think that's going to be the answer in this. Access violation. How does that not, does that not kill the whole process? Yeah. Light 001. All right. Access violation. That's crazy. Uh, what do you guys think? 
My only concern is if it's in a server release. I mean, when's the next time we're going to release a stable version that has this fix? Well, that's why I'm concerned about it being in a long-term server release. Because those are long-term. For, you know, 1809 will, what is it, 18 months? But, but if it's server or long-term release, then, yeah, it could last a little bit longer. The problem is I, I don't, I, I agree, retrying seems wrong. I don't, can you even retry from a GP fault? So it might be something we really, we realistically can't, you know, retry or work around except to, you know, maybe there's a way we can work around the particular bug in 1809. I mean, I guess I'm not interested in fixing or verifying the fix for this. Oh, yeah. But it'd, be a, it'd be a pain. Someone else wants to do it. <laughs> Well, yeah, actually pulling it off is a different question. I had a small retry loop around the code here, and that fixes my problem. I guess you can catch a GP fault. Yeah, the it appears 1809 will be end of life this year, except for enterprise edition, in which case it lasts for another six months. But enterprise long-term servicing channel is I think that version, 1809. They call it LTSC 2019, but it came out the same time as 1809. Mainstream support end date, January 9, File access, file accesses that have retries make sense to me. The access violation makes this weird. Very much agreed. It makes it hard to say, yeah, we should catch that. I mean, we'd have to catch all exceptions, which I guess is what we would do, except not the, the fatal ones, of which I don't think access violation is one of them. SCH something and Stack Overflow one is the other one that throws, I think. Um, that's, just, that's, that's a little mind boggling. I don't know what to do with that. I'm worried that a retry of an access violation is it, it's completely just masking the problem. And that, what, we're not going to get the right answer in the end? Well, no, I guess I'm worried that it's an access violation. Are you really in a good state? Given, given all the P invoking that happens during binding, are we in a good state? Yep. Also, it's, it's worth, you know, it's worth thinking about is this particular operation the same in Wix 4? Yeah, I don't know how it is in Wix 4.
if they sent a PR, would we be taking it? Would we be considered taking it? That validated the problem. I don't know. Catching an access violation exception seems bad. To me. Yeah, it's just bad. Windows 10, 18, or 9, and Server 18. So are we saying no? That catching access violation is not a good thing to do? Well, if you look at the doc, there's you can't catch an access violation exception. You have to do a special handle process corrupted state exceptions attribute. Really? What doc says. Surprises me that they went to that much trouble in this loop. My bet is they're catching exceptions just continuing. But so, what are we thinking here? I'm all for retrying file I/O. I'm negative one on access violation catches. On. Was there workarounds? Yeah, I mean, the yeah, I didn't want to do it. Try. I mean, they can work around it, can't they? Hmm? They said they suppress hashtags that they can skip this code path, right? So I guess. No, <laughs> I don't want to do it. You can't suppress hashing. That's not a real option. Yeah. You'll get an MSI Agreed. that's not good. Mm -hmm. Well, um... <laughs> I mean, it goes back to my original question, then, like, when are we going to release a stable release with this? Yeah, it'd be before. It'd be adding retries around all of the file operations. Mm -hmm. Seem very related to MUI files. Interesting. I wonder what Microsoft did underneath to break this. Like, I wonder what the fix was. <laughs> where the change was that broke it. I could see MUI getting in the way of something like this. All right, sounds like we're not taking this because of the access violation. I mean, if it was the file I.O., that'd yeah, be something. Absolutely, else. yeah. But that access violation, catching access violation is tricky. That's like, yep. here, let's leave the rest of the process in a weird state. All right, I guess that's what we're saying. We're not taking it because of the access violation. We'll see if it comes around big. I'm also interested that we haven't seen more of it, but isn't 1809 older than that? I don't know. It's interesting that more people aren't hitting it. All right, blank rich EULA. This is almost always because the RTF is not good RTF. And you need to open it up in WordPad and save it again. Yep. And no response to my request for additional information a week yeah. ago. Yeah. So we'll we'll point it and then come back if they want. Team viewer not showing pages, only layouts. Yep. Probably a duplicate of 4860. Is this the whole error? Yeah, it doesn't work when I can't find an image. Yep. It should be improved, but yes, I agree. That's a duplicate. Remove outdated documentation. Okay. Oh, VDIS merge modules? Mm, yeah, we probably shouldn't recommend that anymore, huh? Yep. So They're 
almost officially discouraged. Almost officially discouraged. So, yeah, we probably should not do that either. Uh, put it in four and we'll carry on. Should get fixed. Wix nave should provide a heartbeat so Wix can know if it's hung. Yeah, something. We need to do something so it can know that's still working on our cabin. So, uh, yeah, let's put that in four. Might pick that one up. If that's better. where Wix native lives. Yep. There should be some kind of message when mixing MSI and bundle. Uh, this is a long standing thing. Sure. I agree. We should try to catch this as the same file as questionable. Yeah. Uh, not the same file, same fragment. Totally reasonable to put MSI and bundle authoring in the same file, but maybe not the same fragment. Well, I think this is a link time thing. Sure. Right. But I, I'm just saying I don't think it has anything to do with the file. I think it has everything to do with the fragment. Well, yeah, and if it's a link time, files don't matter anymore. Yeah. Um, is that true? There is a scoping to the file I thought that it knew about. There's the compilation ID, but, yeah, that represents the, the file, I think. I, I perhaps was mildly hyperbolic when I yeah. said the files don't matter. So Anyway, uh, but I agree. Uh, we take it in four. I mean, if, Sean, if you want to try to take a shot, it's – Kind of annoying. I'm not exactly sure the best way to solve it. It's probably a lot of. Very, yeah, I don't know how you're going to do that one. So. Aren't we pretty close anyway? Hmm? Sean, you added that warning when an unknown tuple comes in. <laughs> Does Sean sound like Charlie Brown's mom to you, Brad, John, or Bob? Wow, I went through a whole bunch of Brad, things. John, Bob. I don't even know. That was weird. Not to do it it's not getting better. There are, in fact, limits to... I'm catching the sign <laughs> So, can you hear me? Yeah, we don't know. Wow, now it's perfect. <laughs> so... Is it is there a problem with trying to do it at compile time? With it, uh, like doing do it a fragment stuff. Time. Why so the fra not? a fragment could be a fragment, you know, uh, output neutral. No, but so you won't like know until you reference it, the fragment. When is it ever valid to have a fragment with both burn content and MSI content? Oh, within a single fragment. Probably that, not. That's probably agreed, yeah. But the real problem is when you have a fragment and you pull it into a bundle and it contains properties. Yeah, but like I said, trying to catch that during binding is not easy. Yeah, that's what I thought. And I don't know how you catch it during compiling without maintaining a lot of state. Well, well I don't think you can. What... The only thing you can catch at compile time is the, the case of one section with both bundle and MSI isms in it. Right. That would be, that would catch the, you know, that would catch a common case of bundle, bundles referencing property, you know, well, no. Well, so you could say property, well, property ref is already elite. The problem is fragments. When you pull in a fragment that references something, I and mean, we see this with, you know, like on Stack Overflow all the time with um, .NET stuff. Yeah, you know, we have no, the, the thing location. is somewhere somewhere you have a fragment with both. All there's there's no way to run in to the problem really. So you want to tag have... a fragment and say if it has bundle specific stuff or MSI specifics, you have to tag a fragment as MSIisms or bundleisms. And sometimes it can it's indeterminate. Is that true? Or is all the bundle stuff completely isolated? It is today, except that perhaps one day we will have product search, for example, as a custom action. Yep. So that that's the reason it lives in Wix util extension. Right. And but so that would have to not say what type it is. 
or because you essentially have to tag the whole fragment with a type or a you know a whatever content type. <laughs> um, I mean, I think each tuple has to have its type. Some tuples could have multiple types. Okay, but. Like when we're checking the warning, basically we're going to have to go through all the tuples and make sure they all are the same. <laughs> like if we eventually make the searches both MSI and bundle, then as long as everything but those rows are MSI, then that's fine. Well, I guess basically those rows wouldn't create a warning. So yeah, yeah I guess they wouldn't ha they'd have to have no type basically. But I guess I don't see the point in actually tagging the fragment if we're not going to look at it again later. Uh, well, you have to remember per fragment. OK, let me ask. The only way to, to cover the scenario where you are pulling in multiple fragments is to do this at link time. Is that is that no, correct? No, you could if you if you specify this fragment has MSI content in it as you're going along, and then the fra as you're compiling, and then later on you hit something that's not MSI, you could say, hey, this fragment first found MSI stuff in it, so you can't be bundle and the other way around if it first finds bundle stuff in it it could say hey i found non bundle stuff or you know something explicitly not bundle you can't put this in this fragment because you can't mix yeah. and match right within a fragment sure within a fragment but but the real the, the the correctness problem comes from linking in fragments no but right. in order to link in a fragment you have to have somewhere some fragment that has both mm, i don't think that's true um well you have the entry section with both <laughs> no you have so the problem is you can pull in a fragment right with any any number of refs right yeah, but, so, none of the, but his point is that none of the, the refs are all going to be either MSI or bundle specific. Okay, I think that's true since we killed fragment ref. Right. Right. Yeah, without hmm. fragment ref, it probably is true. And that's why you could do it at the compiler. You could also do it at the linker and just say, hey, I'm building, I'm linking an MSI. I mean, the entry section I found is X, and then I found tuples that aren't X. Right. The back end can reject incoming tuples that it doesn't know about. Yeah, and then the back end could do it, too, if the tuples have this state. Then it could say, I mean, yeah, if the tuples say what you know, content type they are. I don't have a better term for what this is because you can't use the word type. Um, that basically, what output type they expect to be part of, then you can what? catch this at, you know, any place with the right amount of state. Well, yeah, but that's why I'm that's why I'm saying backend because remember the you know, backend has plenty of opportunities. The backend is the first output specific opportunity to to identify these things. Right. I, I agree. The back end is better than anywhere else. Because otherwise you do. You have to tag something. You have to inject back end knowledge into the rest of the system, which right. you know, we we sometimes do. But Which we do, uh, and we could avoid here. Um, well there there's no back end system and bundles. So bundles just have tuples. There's no conversion <laughs> there's you know right but no... i'm saying the the one you know there's at a very early stage in the back end process you can say okay now check my incoming tuples everything's been linked everything's been resolved so you have a list of all the tuples that that 
have been pulled in either direct, you know, direct authoring or fragment rest or whatever, or rest to fragment. Um, mm -hmm. And then, then it's a simple, you know, at, at that point, the back end could, if it wants to have a hard coded list of tuples that it knows about, it probably already has that list in, you know, some tuple definitions well, collection. Mm, no, it's probably implicit. Like the bundle is probably implicit. It's like, yeah, I look for this and then I look for this and then I look for this and then I look for this. It never says. Sorry. I, I, no, no, no. I, I acknowledge that this is a new feature in a oh. backend. Yes. I'm saying the backend probably already knows which tuples it supports. It, no extensions. Um. Yeah. Okay. Well, then. Yeah, we could. We'd have to add something. I agree. We'd have to add something so that extensions can identify their tuples. But backend extensions are backend specific. So. Yeah, you. There, we don't have to worry about being too generic there. But in each case, it's, it's a, you know, it's a, I don't know, give me a list of supported tuples or a bool that says verify all tuples are supported or something. It is I guess straightforward I... to put the output type on the tuples. The problem is that I don't think the output types, is, the goal is that in the future, the output types is not a fixed list. So then it's it locks us into the output types if we put them on the individual tuples. Essentially, the tuples up front have to know every kind of output type that they're dealing with. Um, and I don't think which is not unreasonable today, but yeah, going which, forward, which is not unreasonable, right? With Wix three, that would be totally reasonable. With the backend model of V four, that does not have to be true. That you could have a third backend that could span bundle and MSI concepts, for example, and understand them, or more likely the extensions, and understand the search extensions, for example, um, as both MSI and X, right? And importantly, this is a new output type that, you know, it could have its own tuple type space. So it's just the whole thing I don't think we want to burn the concept of output type into tuple up front because of where we're going. Yeah, this is why I'm fine. Even though I do prefer error messages to happen as quickly as possible, I'm okay in saying this is a backend problem. It's a backend decision to make which tuples are supported. Right. That way, you know, um, and, and the same thing with an extension. Today, Wix util extension could say, you know, when the binder or when the backend calls the backend extension in Wix util extension, huh, um, it can say, yep, sorry, today, nope, these are only for, for bundles. So at the t you know the backend can reject. Um, well, actually, actually, was that is that even a problem today? Is there a is there a Windows installer backend extension in Wix util extension? No. So you wouldn't, these would, these would just silently not do their job, which is the scenario. Well, okay. I've already got, it. well, if, if you're, if you're going to say, don't do in the compiler, do in the backend, then I've already got the Windows installer backend catch these things. No. Oh. Problem solved? Bundles don't. The, but The problem is in the bundles. Yeah, but bundles are limited. I mean, even their extensibility is limited. I mean, my problem was that I tried to look into this the other day and basically we're letting we're theoretically letting um, extensions add tuples to the section like at any point in the process. So there's no place in the bundle backend where it says, all right, I'm going to go through all the section, all the tuples in the section, and then I'm not going to look at it again. The, that's not happening today. <laughs> and it didn't look like 
it was going to be an easy fix to make that start happening. No, it'd have to be a phase that the bundle basically says, I'm going to go through here and make sure that you don't have any MSI properties, you know, floating around any MSI property tuples, for example, or whatever in this LinkedIn space. Yeah, if, if there's a Yeah. Uh, Sean, you're breaking up completely. Can you understand it, Bob? No. No. All right. So you just wait for the internet to catch up to Sean. Maybe. I'm not saying anything. Oh. There we oh, go. Really? Oh, wow. Well, oh. It sounded like you were saying something. Uh, that was weird. Um, That's very weird. Um, yeah, I guess that that's an interesting. Although, again, if it's a if it's a backend specific extension, then does it really care about whether things are being added? If it's adding something wrong, well, that's just a bad extension. Yeah, and, yeah. So, Technically being like, yeah, okay, you can do that. That's your prerogative at that point. Um, if you've extended at that point in time. Yeah, I, I don't know this, and, and you can put this check as late as you want. Um, even after the bundle is built, you could check, hey, okay, now that I've built the bundle, let me go make sure that all the data you gave me was valid. Might be a little late at that point. Um, but you could also just put it up front. I'm less worried about extensions designed to enhance the back, the bundle backend, for example, putting bad data in, as, as Bob said. So, I mean, if we really want to catch this, it's a, here, let me go through all the tuples in the um, input in the in the intermediate, and say, are there any in here that I don't recognize? And let me tell you that. And the MSI happens to have that space because it converts every tuple into a table, just given the way it works. And bundles don't work that way, which is why this has slipped through forever. They only look for what they care about, and they don't catch all the bad, the non-bundle stuff. That's the difference between the two of them. But certainly could do okay. a sweep at the beginning that says, all right, I'm going to sweep everything and make sure I, this only includes tuples that I understand. So we'd have to add an extension method saying, do you own this tuple? Is this a valid bundle tuple? Um, I don't know that we need to do that. Um, um, It would be a, it would be a good to have, I think, because that would catch the that would catch the you know the util search. But we already uh, did a we already did a thing where, yeah. But util search is special because the bundle backend knows how to deal with them because it has to turn them into a special entries in the manifest. There's not a custom thing in there. The only thing custom at that point is the bootstrap replication data, which I believe we did a thing that a tuple says of its bootstrap replication data which I didn't feel great wow. about doing, but that's what we did. And now it's unreal. But how how would the MSI backend oh, it's unreal. Got it. prevent? Oh, wait a second. I already, I already implemented the functionality where the searches can be moved out. I haven't actually moved them out, <laughs> but today, if someone did the work, the searches could be moved out into the util extension. The processing for the from the bundle? From the back yeah end. yeah okay then for any tuple we'd have to find the back end that or the bun the extension that handles it i mean that that you're right that's what we'd have to have but we'd have to have that for the searches to work too then right um yes and no because i i created kind of like a parallel data file for bundle extensions so I, I created a tag just like Bootstrap our application data has a tag. So today, the tuple that it creates for the search is tagged as a bundle extension data tuple. Oh, like an annotation tag? Well, I mean, just like the Bootstrap our application data, data tag that you added for the tuples. Like, you know, you can add a tag on the tuple. 
So there's a well-known tag for bootstrapper application data, and there's a well-known tag for bundle extension data. I see. Right. Yeah, I wasn't thrilled with the way that I had to solve bootstrapper application data. Right, but then so you have the information because the extensions get the extension data gets the tuple gets tagged then. Oh, you're breaking up. I missed that. All right, so let's say the extension wants to create a tuple at the compile time and then it wants to convert that tuple to a, a data tuple. So it doesn't want to put that tuple directly into the data file. At, during the back end, it wants to convert it, basically. Uh -huh. So now you have an extension tuple that's technically a bundle tuple, but it's not gonna it's not gonna be tagged. Does that make sense? No, I'm missing that. Why would it lose its tag? The compiler, it won't remember its tag from the compiler. So let's say, let's say for the searches that it compiles the search into like a search tuple. And then during the backend phase, it can, it creates a new uh, bundle extension data tuple based on the information that was in the search tuple. Yeah, if we're going to so go that bundle... way, we should go the same way as the extensions and have a for Windows installer and have a call out to the extensions that says, "Hey, here's your data. You need to process this and give it back to us in the form that we expect." Um, whatever that is, I think we're going to do something like that. And you know, Windows installer turns them into rows, so this would turn them into whatever it has to turn into to be a. And it could be maybe, I mean, if it, just, if it is just a Boolean, it could be like, hey, is this bootstrap application, or is it, yeah, is this a bootstrap extension data? And the answer could be, yes, that is. Please put it in the extension data place. Lost all that. <laughs> There's something basically there. replace the tags. And um, where do I need? To, uh, so, what if that new method is where the extension gets a tuple from the back end, and then it can return any number of Bootstrap or application data tuples, any number of bundle yeah. extension data tuples. Yeah. yeah, same as the and, way. Yeah, same as Windows installer. Yeah, and then. Also, some kind of Boolean saying that, yeah, this is this was my tuple. I processed it. Uh, sure. Um, yeah. Yeah, not an error. Yeah, here's my data. I actively, or yes, I recognize that. And here is zero or more data. Yeah. As opposed to, I don't know what that is. And of course, I'm not giving you any data. It's a try pattern, right? Try to process this. If Boolean's true, the out parameter is valid. Is that not how the Windows installer data stuff works today? Or they just return null? Um, it's also a Boolean. Yeah. yeah. But they have they have a, a, a backend helper that they call that to they call to feed the data in. Yeah, that's right. To yeah, create rows. So maybe we have a helper that says, you know, create bootstrap or application row or whatever. Could do. Yeah, could do that. That would be then. Yeah, that would be. That way you don't have to get it all in one out. You can just say, yeah, I processed. Yeah, it's good, and I did whatever I needed to do by calling the, essentially it's a callback using the helper mechanism. I used that callback to add data. But 
the helper doesn't have a, it has a lot of things on it, right? Like any register keys and stuff like that. Register the nodes. back end, yeah, the, the back, back end, end helper does not. Yeah, okay. You're thinking of the parse helper. I'm thinking of the parse helper. It doesn't. Yeah, okay. Right, because that can just create registry rows when the compiler extension hits it, which is easier than writing a backend, right? Right, right. So I, I think somewhere in that pattern is the maintaining that same pattern is about the right thing. Now, having passing the backend helper in versus returning the data type that you expect out kind of depends on do you know what the data type coming out is. Um, I have to go look at the backend helper to remember why we might have picked that. I don't remember all the all the inputs that you can do from a, a backend extension. Oh, there's like, is it resolving files and stuff like that? Is that what I'm, is that parts of it too? I mean, no, resolve, resolution is all backend neutral. Yeah, that's earlier. I, think, I mean, the thing is, the thing is the backend helper, there's like a Windows installer backend helper. Yes. Yes. And there, I don't think there is a bundle backend helper. No, today. No, not today, because because they don't. Th there's nothing you can do in there. Oh, it's in services. What can you do? Try add tuple. So it's just adding tuples. Oh, okay. Yeah, we probably did that because of the try add, as opposed to saying here, generate your tuples and hand them back as an enumerable, or you know whatever. Then it was like, yeah, here, call this thing and try to add what you needed to add. And that probably matches the way we were using it in the past. That's why the Windows installer backend helper is the way it is. And then we have the whole column zero as ID mess. Because this could have instead returned a set of two, of, you know, um, try to add a tuple to matching table definition. Wait a minute. Well, the problem, the problem in Windows Installer is that you have to, there's no way, like, you have to create the row from the table. You can't just new up your row. Yep. Yeah, because of all the table definition management that we're trying to do. Yeah, try add tuple to output. Right, that's what we call. We also have res resolution stuff in here. And then the I backend, the I Windows installer backend helper is available. So if you want to auto match your tuples to table definitions, it can do that for you. Right. Right, right, right. And a single call to adding to a tuple may create more than one. Um, add more than one row. May change the Windows installer data output in more than one way. Yep. 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 So this could. The thing is that we don't have. I don't, is there a? There, yeah, there's no bundle Windows installer data concept for bundles. No. Nope. I mean, we could theoretically start using tables again no tables aren't going to help us there um that's not what we need the that, that they were always just this weird mapping to things underneath we, we would create a i mean it would need more of a well what can you add like so today in wix3 the only thing you can add to is to boost sharp application data that's all you can add to it's the only thing that's extensible in mm -hmm. Wix 3 today. It sounds like there's now two things that are extensible in Wix 4. The extension data and the Windows and the um, BA data, right? Is 
that right? I don't know. Sean, did I lose you? No, in V3, you could create that. Yeah, you did. <laughs> can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so uh, in V3, you can create a custom table and say this is Bootstrapper application data. Yep. And then you can define that table however you want. Yep. So that's so all that, you could do is you could add Bootstrap application data. That's all you could add. Yeah, so like there was no way for an extension to do it other than creating a custom table. Oh yeah, because everything was a custom table then. Um, so now we, we, we can provide bundles. I, do we need to provide bundles more than bootstrap application data, I guess is the thing. Now you said there's this bootstrapper extension data, which I haven't looked at yet. Yeah. And so there's now That's... bootstrapper application data and bootstrapper extension data, both of which a tuple could participate, could contribute to. Right. And so, yeah, it seems like you need an extension to say, hey, let me pick how to put these two things in there. I think I have to go back. We did the Bootstrap application tag as a quick fix, right, Bob? I'm, I'm fuzzy. Sorry, quick fix for what? Just to get it working, the Bootstrap application data. Sorry, I, I'm I'm missing some context. As opposed to what? To re-implement the Bootstrap application data concept being created from tuples. I don't know why we needed that. We needed it for something. Because I remember it being like a minor emergency when I had to get it working. I don't remember the context of all of it. So. How else do you get data into a BA? Right. That's what it was. It was arbitrary tuples without extensions. Right. Well, no, not tuples back then, but... Yeah, I mean, table definitions, right. Custom. Yeah. Oh, it was custom tables. It was custom tables. The custom sure. table element. That's well, what was... That's what you have in MSI, right. And... Um, and and remember, we, we had the mix unreal. of... And then we made it Unreal, right? That's what you said. In V4. Yeah, yeah. In V4 is all Unreal tables that end up inside the Bootstrap application, that end up in the bundle, end up turning into Bootstrap application data. That's where we ended up, yeah. right? That, yeah. That's more of a, ba a bundle backend going, uh, sure, this must be what you want to do with it. Because it's Unreal. Because it's an Unreal table. Because why else would you have a custom table? Inside a bundle, right? Getting linked into your bundle... As long as there's no backend warning that says you can't have custom tables in a right. back. So when you hit to this point where you want to start throwing errors, then you end up with the oh no, you have to have an extension to declare that it's okay for that to be a custom for that custom table to flow through. Although I suppose right. we could say all custom table tuples are safe. But maybe that's bad. <laughs> well, it's a nice escape hatch. The, I think for bundles, well, the custom table was specifically for the the things that. For, for the authoring, uh, sorry, for the for the elements that weren't backed by uh, by an extension that would create known custom tables. Remember, we had all the magic variables. Yeah. So yeah, we needed support for custom tables. Right. So that we didn't have to spend time in the extension. Right. Which just postponed the time that we spent in the extension. But yeah. Sometimes that's what you do. Well, yeah, it, and it's a easy way to add Bootstrap application data to a bundle it, by purely creating a custom table. It's a funky name for it. We should have probably we could probably create an element called Bootstrap application data to be more yeah that that's specific. A, that's a much better much better solution. Why didn't you think of that back then? No, I think it was it was it was duress. Part of it was duress at that right. time. Yeah. <laughs> so then that would solve the problem of custom tables or of, yeah, custom tables showing up. Again, custom table could be not allowed in a bundle and the bundle could check and say, hey, look, you have this Bootstrap application data ailment. I let that through, of course, because that's what it's for. 
I think for what the more extensive things like you're talking, Sean, I think what we're what we're talking about is adding the same sort of extensibility model that the Windows installer backend has to the bundle backend. And I don't think I considered doing anything like that before because, well, we didn't do that. We just had the custom table thing and just propagated that pattern, um, arguably incorrectly, again, and should have created a bootstrap application data element instead. No reason we can't do that now. No, no reason we can't fix it now. Um, but that, so that fits, I think, for then for extensions that aren't adding bootstrap application data by using a custom table or whatever element that ends up becoming named, um, an Unreal custom table that is, then, yeah, if you want to add arbitrary tuples and have them get through, then the bundle has to go, uh, I don't know what that tuple is, its type is custom, so I can go out and extend, ask an extension, do you recognize this in the context of a bundle? And the extension could say yay or nay, and if it does, then do the whatever it needs to do to put it into the appropriate place in the bundle, which at that point, why didn't you just put it in the right place in the first place? Why don't you make a bootstrap application data in the very beginning? Or bootstrap extension data if we have if we need a second thing when the compiler extension ran. And I think this is where we end up because unless your extension needs to run in the context of knowing the entire space, I guess that's something. If your extension wants to run in the being able to know the entire space of the uh, bundle. Right, like I can see, okay, now I can see the whole thing about the bundle. Now I'm going to decide what rows I put in the Bootstrap application data or whatnot. I guess that makes sense. And you can't do that today without having an extensibility point the way that when a installer has an extensibility point in its backend. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. All right. So, so this would mean I could get rid of the tags, right? Yes, I think so. Now, I'm really fuzzy why the bootstrap application data tag is in there. I don't know why it's in there. I, I have to go dig into it to go figure out, oh, right, that's why we did this thing. But I don't know why I did that. Part of me hopes it's like left accidentally left over from before we made the decision to go to Unreal. Because I remember the Unreal decision was kind of like, oh, wait, if we do, the, oh, and the Unreal ended up trickling down, right, Bob? It ended up being all around. It ended up changing more. Yeah, there was something. No, that was Unreal Columns. That was Unreal Columns. I'm Unreal Columns, yeah, yeah. That was yeah. later. Yeah, I'm still, sorry, I'm still stuck on the idea that we should have just introduced the bootstrapper application data element. Yeah, I don't know what I was not thinking. Yeah. How did how did that not occur to either of us when we were having these discussion? Well, the problem is you need a table definition. What's that? You need a table definition so they can declare all the columns and everything. So it was probably just faster to just reuse what was already there. Pro yeah, probably. It it would look a lot like custom table. Yes. Yeah. And custom tables ugly. It's ugly and and it's a little weird because we have we have custom tables. The the same element both defines the columns okay. and adds rows. Yeah, as opposed to having a custom table definition and a custom table, because I guess maybe that would be a custom table. I don't know. Yes. Or a custom table and custom table ref is because it, it acts more like a reference. Yeah, the only trick is that the ref can have child children can have children, yeah. which is unusual but not completely. Unseen. Mm, I don't think we have any other case where a rough app search. App search can have children. Yeah. I, I guess directory ref does too. So. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, Feature ref. Right. Yeah. Okay. So I guess it's not that unusual. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's not that bad then. I don't know. Yeah, it's probably fine. The other thing is that custom table, 
Yeah, custom table ref probably would have worked because in the custom table you can both define it and add data to it. Um, you'd have right. to separate those, so I had that as well. Yeah. Anyway, uh, definitely a mistake in the original implementation of it. So um, yeah, we could straighten that out here too. But um, yes, that that makes some sense. And I have not been in a lot of this stuff for quite a long time, so I'm a little fuzzy on on it. But yes, if adding an extensibility model to the burn backend that is similar to the Windows installer backend to add the data, I'm not against that. If that ends up being a useful concept as you pull the searches out and make them more, I don't know, native. But if they can just be done as, hey, as a compiler, let me add some bootstrapper application or bootstrapper extension data or bootstrapper application data tuples, well then that's fine too. Cool. All right. Tell me that's the end of triage. Jeepers. <laughs> All right. No more opening bugs by you guys. Holy cow. <laughs> hey, mine weren't easy. Yeah. Um, anything else anybody else wants to talk about? There's three people uh, out there. 314. 314. Oh, right. We need to do a build, right? Because we got the fixes, Bob and Sean. Uh, yes, we did. You have yeah. all your fixes in, Bob, and I saw Sean say that he got all his fixes in. So, yes, let's do a build on Friday. Get all that out. Cool? Okay. Excellent. All right. That's easy. The Ides so, of May. Uh, theoretically, we could go over that bundle extension thing if you wanted, but this is probably already too long. Yeah, I'm tired. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Hey, let's save that for two weeks from now. Uh, May 27th, we'll do it all again. Uh, yes. Same time, same place. We'll get this rolling again. And uh, we'll see. Uh, we'll see what we see there. And uh, it will not be. Uh, it'll be meeting 189, closing on 190. I don't know, man. I guess 10 meetings. Let's see, 12 meetings. So we're done with this one. So 11 meetings. Or is it 12? I still be 12 at zero base counting. Um, Off by one. Yeah. Then we will be at 200. Yeah, so 12 is two months. That's still three months away. Wow. By the end of the summer, we'll be at 200. That'll be pretty crazy, won't it? Anyway. We should uh, have a party. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Something. Wait, 12, 12 meetings is 24 weeks. 12 meetings. Oh, yeah. 24 weeks. Oh, you're right. I'm dividing my two. Wow, that's, that's wishful thinking. 24 weeks. Okay, well, then that's not at all close. Still this year. Hmm. Okay, I guess, yeah. Yeah. Maybe. Um, <laughs> if we don't skip. If we don't skip too many, that's true. I don't know. I have a feeling this four is going to make things interesting here, and we will not be skipping um, as we go along. So on that note, uh, this is the end of Wix meeting 188. We're probably getting way ahead of ourselves to 200 since I can't count by twos, and um, or at least I count the wrong way by twos, eh, wherever that goes. Uh, we'll yeah, be back hard. Two weeks. Oh, no, no, no. I'm actually okay-ish at math. I'm really bad at dates and times. We all know that. It's like me and adding sure. dates and times. It's not just math. It's time I have real problems with, and I don't know why. <sighs> anyway, we'll be back in two weeks. According to my calendar, that says the 27th, which I think I can call that one correctly. And we'll be back at 3.30, Fire Giant Standard Time, which is Pacific Daylight Time right now. Um, you guys can adjust your clocks accordingly. We'll see you in two weeks. Later. Bye. Bye.